Hey everyone, thanks for joining for another episode of DeLorean Talk. This is Dave Tavers, VIN 10515, talking to you from Walt Disney's hometown of Marceline, Missouri. It has been a great time for me moving out here to the Midwest. People here are super nice. The small town life is so different from LA and Seattle and San Francisco and Vegas for me, but really enjoying it, other than being the only DeLorean for a couple of hours in any direction. But... And if you listen to the last episode, I did go to the 2023 DCS up in Crystal Lake, Illinois, by Chicago. Met a bunch more people I'd never met before. And today, I'm excited to have Alex Michael on the show. Hi, Alex. Hi. Great to hear you again. Yeah. We got to chat a little bit at the show, and you're a character, super nice guy. You've got a, a very different background than most people in general life. And... Uh, <laughs> And I, one of the things that stands out about you is that you were not one of the 90% of people that got a DeLorean because they saw Back to the Future first. So we'll talk about that. <laughs> but let's start with just some basic information. Where do you live? I live in Germany, about like, like 20 minutes outside of Munich. And you are a world traveler because you're in the music industry. Yeah. I mean, I, I travel a lot. <laughs> let's put it that way. Like... I, I actually have just been to the States before DCS in California, which was nice. A couple of my friends were playing in San Diego, Santa Ana, and at the Whiskey in Hollywood. Nice. The only bad thing was like I had to drive a Mustang. Which is <laughs> not... Alex Michael doesn't drive an effing Mustang. No. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard that story, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I saw that. And I can totally relate to that. And it's like, no, no. As a rental car, it was okay. But like, Jesus, there were already pieces falling off the damn car. Oh, well, maybe that so, was just a rental. And everything is so cheap about it. I mean, when you compare it to like the Camaro convertible, because they gave me a, a convertible. I was like, you know, I'm by myself. I don't have a lot of luggage with me. So, okay, th that sounds like fun. But, yeah. like, just like the small things, and there was always a massive difference between Chevy and Ford. Like, the not existing quality that they have <laughs> at Ford. I don't know if it's good or bad that they didn't have a DeLorean at the rental office. <laughs> yeah. Probably would have been rented out. Almost would have happened in like 82, which is crazy enough. But then like, you know, some government sources made sure like, no, let's stop that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And we're going to talk about your book, which is Looking Inside, The Stainless Sensation by Alex Michael. Beautiful, beautiful book. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I love hearing people's DeLorean stories. Part of your DeLorean story is connected to music, right? Yeah. So, but let's go back a little bit. What is your, I don't know, I don't want to say job. What do you do for a living? What's your background? What do you, what is it that you do? Well, I actually, I do a lot of things. I mean, like I play in a band called Shameless since like <laughs> a very long time. And then I also play with Cherie Curry, who used to be the lead singer in The Runaways back in the 70s. But she's still rocking and we just, actually we toured in the UK and... Scandinavia and the coolest thing was that we played Belfast on the anniversary of John's passing. Wow, nice. So that was really cool and then the next day before we left we went to the old factory and just took a photo outside but I also had um, guitar picks made for that show that showed like a DeLorean on one side and then me uh, it was kind of like a, like a photo thing, like me inside of a wheel, pretty much on the other side. But like people love them, you know. So yeah. I, thought... I bought one of your books at DCS, and you gave me one of those pics. So I'll I'll put oh, a yeah. photo oh, of it on the on this episode page as well. Oh, cool. 
So you are a musician. You do world traveling. Like I said a second ago, you're one of the few people that didn't want to buy the car because of Back to the Future. How does that start? Go all the way back to the beginning when you first learned about the car. What is that story? Okay. Since I was like seven, I was a massive Kiss fan. Still am, you know. And in, I think it was like May of 83 or like maybe like a month later, there was a German magazine called Bravo, which is kind of like what you had... In the States, you, you had 16 and Teen Beat, like, like those kind of magazines. So inside the magazine, there was an article about Ace, and there was a picture of Ace right next to this weird-looking car. Most people know Kiss are really famous for the, like, outrageous, like, photo shoots, you know, with, like, flames and stuff. Outrageous everything, ships. yeah. Exactly. Ace is the lead singer for Kiss. Oh, he's the lead guitar player. Lead, thank you. Ace is the lead guitar player for Kiss. Got it. The Spaceman. And so I, I saw the picture, and I was like, wow, that's a cool photo shoot. But of course it was not a photo shoot. It was just like two pictures put together. One was of Ace from that period, and the other one was a picture of a DeLorean. Hmm. And then I read the article, and somebody i knew like said like no no that, that that's actually a real car oh wow how old were you again when you saw that i was 13 13 so and at 13 you're you know even if you're into cars that's an obscure car you might not know anything about it and you didn't what what trust me when you grow up in germany you can't be into cars that that's impossible because like especially at that point i mean there's nothing more boring than german cars especially <laughs> I always give the example like now you show somebody an episode of Streets of San Francisco, uh -huh. you know, with Carl Malden and Mike Douglas. Yeah. And then you compare it to like a German show from that period. When you watch Streets of San Francisco, you think, oh, my God, like there's one classic right next to the other one. <laughs> and then you watch the German thing and you think like, oh, my God, look at those pieces of trash that they're driving around but then you realize hey wait a second those were like the brand new cars. <laughs> so it's horrible at that age i mean like the only car that i was into was the batmobile from comic books because like when i was 13 i know i knew the adam west the movie i i didn't even know there was a also a tv series wow. of the 66 batman i only knew about the batman movie because like we had a movie theater here in munich that would always have this double feature of the Kiss movie, Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, and either Batman or Rocky or Picture Show. Wow. It's still like to this day, I always have to laugh because like, I mean, I got into Rocky or Picture Show when I was nine. <laughs> oh, so, and then showing it to other friends at the same age. And they were like, they, they just looked at me and were like, what the <laughs> fuck did we just watch? Especially because they never translated the movie into German. So <laughs> if you didn't understand English, you were... <laughs> right, the visuals <laughs> were enough, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the visuals for like a nine-year-old guy or girl were like, what the <laughs> well, hell is he showing us? Yeah, exactly. So you knew about the Batmobile, and that, that was your main car, and then you see yeah. this picture of Ace with the DeLorean in the magazine. Yeah, and I was like... Jesus, what is that? that? That is, like, incredible. And back then in, like, 83, it was kind of, like, hard to find stuff out, especially at that point, like, like the company didn't even exist anymore. So it was not like you go to a local dealership newsstand, yeah, oh. and, and get a magazine or whatever, you know, yeah. to do some more research. So for me, it was just, like, really cool and... I remember like a couple of years later, I, I saw a couple of articles about the car, and but nothing really major. It yeah. was not like the States where you pretty much had all the coverage, you know, like uh, the, the stuff that John went through and whatever. The only time, and obviously when you're like 14, you're not really reading newspapers. No, no. Or following so I, drug cases, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that was just... But funny enough, later I found the German articles about that whole trial and none of the press really said anything bad about John. They just said like, what a shitty organization the FBI is for doing that. Yeah. 
things haven't changed much. <laughs> no, absolutely. And then like when I started to get more into cars and stuff, because like it was all in, when was this, like 92, I went to the States. Oh, actually, it was 93. Went to the States and I was supposed to stay there for like two weeks. But at that point, I couldn't get a rental car because I, I was only 23. So my friend told me, well, you can drive my, my dad's Cadillac. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, that, that car is like twice the size of my <laughs> horrible VW crap car that I had at the time. <laughs> and I never even know about automatic cars. Oh, so, wow. Because here everything was manual. Yeah. And then... He said, what, well, just forget that you have a left leg and let's try it here in the parking <laughs> spot. It took me like two minutes and I was like, okay, I'm, I know how to do this. And then I drove that Cadillac and it was, it was an old one. It must have been like from like early 70s or something. Okay. And I was like, I'm never going to go back to the shitty German car. So <laughs> when I came back, I sold the VW and I bought a, a Trans Am. Wow. How old was the Trans Am at that point? The Trans Am was like um, from the, uh, God, like, it was a second gen. Okay. It was still an 80s Trans Am? No, it was more like a 70s. Okay. 70. It was not the, but the Bandit version it was the, the, the 79. Well, actually like Bandit 2, but like more yeah. like. The, okay. It was a formula in silver. And what I liked the most about it was the interior was bright red. I, and I remember showing it to my mother and she said something like, oh my God, that car looks like it belongs to a whore. And I was like, that's <laughs> perfect. As long as I fit in my guitar cases, I was like, okay, I'm You're good. good. <laughs> Fitting for a musician as well. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. You know. The, the <laughs> so you drive the Cadillac, you get hooked on the American cars, you come home yeah. to Germany, you buy a, a Trans Am. How soon before the DeLorean kind of makes its reappearance in your life? I think like two years later, I was on tour and I, I met, <laughs> how do you say that? I met a new friend. Let, let's put it that way. Okay. And after the show, I stayed at her place instead of the hotel. And the next day we had a day off. So we were just like hanging out there. And then she was like, oh, do you want to watch a movie? I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? And then she tells you about like, why well, have you ever seen Back to the Future? I was like, nope, w w what is that? Because <laughs> like in the 80s when that movie came out, I was just like always busy with doing other stuff. So I was not really looking for new movies or something. Yeah. So she puts the movie on and I'm like, you know, and then the famous scene on the parking lot comes. And I'm like, oh my God, they used Ace's car for that movie. That is so <laughs> fucking cool. <laughs> Because for me, I mean, like, I totally get the, the the thing was like, you know, how people got into the car because of Back to the Future. Cause it's, I guess the same as like how some people got into Trans Ams because of Smokey and the Bandit for or sure. Knight Rider. Yeah. You know, <laughs> which still doesn't mean that David Hasselhoff should ever sing. but <laughs> <laughs> Or the Batmobile, right? You see that exactly. movie that's as a kid, that's what you connect with. Yeah, but like... You're 26 the first time you see Back to the Future. 25. 25. Yeah. And your first reference is, oh, they used Ace's car. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I thought the movie was fucking great, but like, it, it's still to this day, I don't have that connection. Yeah. Like, I understand it when I see people like, you know, like doing the time machines and all that stuff, but then I'm like, can somebody just take all that stuff off and leave it how ace would drive it <laughs> <laughs> so at that point you are watching back to the future with this girl that you met at a, at a show yeah what happens after that are you is that when it kind of caught your attention you thought wait this is a real car or was it years later when you said oh i, I should go back and learn more about that um, the most i learned about this was <laughs> thank god to another girl I was dating this um, dancer, let's put it that way, and from Batminster, New Jersey, I met her. Say I that again, uh, Batman in New Jersey? Uh, no, Batminster, New Jersey. Oh, Batminster, also... in Batminster, yeah. okay, in, in John's backyard. I know, and, and like, cause I met her at a Kiss show, Wells, <laughs> and <laughs> we somehow, like, you know, 
we were driving somewhere and then she said like that's the house where john delorean lives oh my gosh and i was like oh and i was like really for me that was like you know that's unbelievable and then like there was a dealership like a you know used car place like in jersey somewhere else like 10 minutes away and they had a delorean there wow and it was actually it was super cheap i remember it was definitely it was less than fifteen thousand. oh wow yeah and this was let me think must have been like spring of 97 okay and the car like looked completely fine but like at that point i was just like traveling all the time and so i was like and i thought about like buying the car and leaving it there because i was always there but then like her living apart um, arrangement was not the best like she didn't have a garage or anything and i was like no you can't buy a car like that and then leave, leave it, out. it outside yeah yeah oh my god especially in the winter in jersey there oh. I remember. yeah it was like sometimes there was so much snow like you couldn't <laughs> even leave the house <laughs> So was, okay, no, that's not good. So that's a good, good choice to not buy it then. All right. Yeah, but I still remember like it had the black interior. I don't remember oh. if it was a manual or an automatic. That that somehow slipped my mind. And no, but like I was definitely into it. And then there was just like afterwards, there was just so much stuff happening. You know, it was like the music and all of that stuff. You were so, busy. Yeah. Yeah. And then I just didn't have time, you know, to buy a Deloitte. And this was also at that point, like, you know, I can only imagine that it was not easy to find parts for the car in like 96 or, or at any of those, you know, the second half of the 90s. So just imagine that in Germany. Oh, yeah. And the Internet was basically brand new. Yeah. So you had some mailing lists, but there wasn't a lot of information out there about crossover parts and uh, yeah. Nothing, nothing. Yeah. And it was pretty much like, well, you know, like with the Trans Am, it was easy. It was yeah. super easy because at that point, yeah, the internet, you already had access to like the uh, the simpler pages. And what I would always do is um, a lot of our records we recorded in Orange County in California. And what I did was like, let's say like, we would always start like recording at noon, but because of jet lag and everything, I would wake up at like six in the morning and then I would just go to all the junkyards in the area and buy all the rare parts for Trans Ams, Firebirds, Camaros for wow. pretty much no money. I, Cause like here in Germany, there was a massive market for like the third gen Trans Ams, you know, cause like everybody wanted to have like a, David Hasselhoff car. <laughs> right. Plus, I'm assuming they didn't make Trans Ams over in Europe at that point, so everything no. had to be imported, which meant everything was more expensive. Exactly. And the incredible part was, like, especially the rear wings and the T-tops, like none of the junkyards would ship stuff at that point. Oh, yeah. Sure. So they had tons of them. I'm curious if when you went to these junkyards, you saw any DeLoreans. No. Or it wasn't on your radar at that point. So at what point did you start thinking about buying a DeLorean? It was in 2010, 10, 11 or something like that. But then it was still like it was kind of on my radar. But I was more into like the history of the whole thing, like reading, you know, like the books and like starting to watch all the documentaries and, and all of that stuff. And then it was just like in, it took another eight years, you know, until I was like, okay, because I just came back from a tour and I was like, okay, now it's time. I, I got to get one. What was the reason that you said it's time to get one? <laughs> It was actually like the main reason was like I wrote a song for um, a soundtrack for Susie Quattro. And when I got paid for that, I was like, okay, now it's the perfect timing to buy one. Extra cash. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, exactly. Because I'm always like with stuff like that, I'm not the fastest person because I also have a 1987 Corvette in gold. And that oh, wow. took me also over five years to get that car because I knew – I didn't want any of the 84 models and the more research I did, I was like, okay, 
only the 87 had the better TPI version, and this was the last year where they sold them in gold. So, like, this was, like, the best combination. It took me a couple of years until I actually found one. Wow. And with the loin, it was, that was actually, like, pretty fast. Like, once I knew, okay, I got to pull the trigger, then I did some research, found someone in the States in Ocala, Florida. It's, like, a really small town like like 40 or 50 minutes away from Orlando. And that's where I found the car. Did you find it online or through a friend? I found it through a guy I know in Holland because like he was always going to the States. And he talked to that guy because the guy actually had two cars. One was a manual with only like 5,000 miles on. But funny enough, that car needed way more work hmm. than mine. And mine was an automatic and had the white stripes on. I was like, okay, that's exactly what I want. And like, it didn't have rust on, on the frame and no dents. And I was like, okay, everything else you can fix. Yeah. Did you know that you wanted a wide stripe automatic? Like before you went looking? Or did you have a checklist or did it not matter? Well, um, kind of, cause like I'm not, in, since like that Cadillac, incidents like in 93 <laughs> i never went back to driving manuals oh wow you got hooked i i still don't like it because i always feel like it's extra work and like i'm like a driver like i i just like to drive around like, like you know like like small roads like country roads and stuff like that and to be honest my automatic i mean i just saw it today like it drives great. Like the only thing we did right in the beginning was like to replace the computer, the automatic computer. Sure. That was the only thing. And since then, I mean, I know this guy that has like an 82 Corvette with the California specs, you know, was like that way strict catalytic system. Yeah. And catalytic Corvette, converter and all of yeah. the smog stuff. Exactly. And there's... Like, I actually think the Corvette is slower than the DeLorean is. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And even if it's faster, if you try to drive a Corvette, one of those third gens, through the mountain roads and stuff, you're not going to get far in that car. It's like an, when you compare it to my C4, for example, or the DeLorean, the handling is so terrible. It, it's it's <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, in the States, it's different because you have all those straight, long roads. So, like, you don't ever have the chance. Right, like. right. It, it, most of the place, we have good roads. We don't have a lot of little country mountain roads. So, going back to Ocala, so you, you know a guy from Holland who says, hey, there's one for sale in yeah. Florida. What was that story? Um, no, he got me his email because, like, he already said he is buying the other one. Oh, your buddy from Holland was buying the manual. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Because, like, and it was crazy because, like, he paid, like, 10000 more than I did. And just because it only had, like, 4,000 miles on. But, like, I know he spent so much money on getting that car right because <laughs> that thing was just sitting. Yeah, for too long. Not being driven, not being taken care of. No, everything needed to be redone. And mine was the one that he always drove. That's oh, also there you go. That's the old adage, right, with the DeLoreans. You have to drive them or else they start to degrade. Exactly. I mean, like, well, let's be realistic. He didn't go on any crazy road trips because the guy is already, like, now he's, like, 86. Wow. You didn't buy the car to have it in the U.S. You bought it to send it back to Germany, right? Yeah. So and how did that happen? What was the process for that? Well, shipping costs from the States to Germany is actually super easy. I mean, I did it a lot of times even before the internet was really mainstream. The first car I imported from the States was like in 97 or something, which was a Daytona Pace car Trans Am. All you need is like a good shipping company. And when the car arrives here, you do the customs, which is like you have to fill out a couple of forms and it's not a big deal. But then on the other hand, I started to import and export stuff from the states when i was like 12. oh my gosh so you were used to it it wasn't a big shock no so bringing it was... over a delorean was no different than bringing over one of the other cars 
it's like it's pretty much the same as like buying like some vintage Kiss dolls. Just like the package is bigger, but like in the end, there's not that big of a difference. You just have to do a little bit of research when you do it the first time, like with everything that you do in life. I mean, right. like when we were kids and we didn't know how to go to a store, and you learn it. And even with my first car, it was not a big deal. It was like a Good. day of work, and I was. Did you come over here to Florida to buy it, or did you buy it sight unseen? I bought it on scene because, like, my guy was like, you know, the car is great. Um, needs a few little things because, like, it had some disco lights, like, that was, like, combined with some alarm system. Like, oh. you know, like, typical 80s crap, like, the bezel of the, the license plate in the back had all those little holes drilled in with, like, green, red, and yellow lights. <laughs> <laughs> so that was custom modification that he did. Oh my god, yeah. That, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> and it was just like, but I mean, the guy drove it all the time. I mean, not on long trips. He was pretty much just like driving it around in Ocala. Local. Yeah. But it was loved, it was used, and yeah. he. it was time for him to get rid of it. So awesome. So you bought it, got it over to Germany. What yeah. happened at that point? Then I picked it up in Amsterdam, and at that point, because I, I was not 100% sure if really everything was fine since the guy never took it on any longer trips or whatever, and also in Germany, you first have to register it uh -huh. before you're able to drive it. So I had it shipped from Amsterdam to Munich, and then I did the typical, you know, like the German paperwork, which was funny because like that idiot you know, said something like, oh, you need the, the, the European taillights for the car. And I was like, there is no, <laughs> there are no European taillights. And oh, he was like, funny. no, I know there are. I said like, yeah, there was a pro, there were two prototypes in the UK, but those are like in private hands and they were never available for anyone. So this yeah. is oh, how funny. what the car always had and it will stay like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Did you know any personally know any DeLorean owners at the time that you bought your car? Not really. You didn't have any buddies other than your buddy in Holland who bought at the same time. Yeah, exactly. But when, in Germany, I didn't know anyone. So you get it home and you don't have anybody to hang out with, to ask questions of other than using the internet. And you just had to figure things out on your own. Yeah. I mean, like there was a, a German... There's a German board, like, a, how do you call it, like a forum? Uh-huh, message board. Yeah, which is so outdated. Hmm. <laughs> no, it's like using an 8-track in your new <laughs> Tesla. <laughs> oh, that would be a funny picture. <laughs> no, and like, yeah, most of the stuff, like, I, I just did research, and I met one really cool guy. His name is Christian. Like, he doesn't even live far away from me. He bought one of the... The company cost like he has a, a super early win like 600 something wow that still didn't have the leather wrapped steering wheel and, and like tons of other things you know and so and he told me a few things and, and then then I, I met more people here in germany but like i was more talking with people like in the states online sure, sure. yeah what is your vin number 10227 Two two seven. I'm ten five one five. So we're we're oh. close cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was built in December eighty two, uh, eighty one. One. December eighty one, and well, it wasn't registered until some point in ninety nine. Oh, it never got registered. Nope. Wow. It was in some kind, not museum, but like some in, in Detroit. Interesting. And so. The guy that I bought it from, he bought it like, like there was like, I wish I would know the name of the place because like he didn't even remember it. They closed that place down and he bought that DeLorean. Was it just a warehouse of cars or was it some kind of a... Like that, that's a thing that I don't even know. Wow. So it's, a, it's an 82, but it wasn't registered for the first time until 97? No, no, I think it was 98. 98. No, hold on. He bought it in 98, but then it still took him like 
two years because decor at that point also needed everything. Sure. Because it was just sitting there for like six, 18 years. Yeah. Six, six, you know, and so it needed a lot of stuff. Sure. That is interesting. I've not heard that before that a DeLorean sat that long without being registered. Yeah. Huh. Cool. So now you've got the internet, you've got a car. Are you driving it much? Or once you get it up and running, are you driving it much around town? Are you yeah. enjoying it? Are you people ask, you know, doing the typical, everybody's excited about it? Because you've got to be one of the few ones in the Munich area. Yeah. Well, actually, there's a few of them here. But like once it was registered, I drove it all the time. <laughs> I know this sounds like a little bit weird. I wanted stuff to break so I knew what was wrong or what needed to be replaced. Sure. Because well, nothing is worse than like, you know, when you don't know and then like all of a sudden like something breaks and it's kind of like unexpected. But I kind of already knew like, you know, especially if the car was not driven on any longer trips or stuff that there will be stuff that will break. Yeah. Like, the fuel pump died within like two months, then the alternator died and like, you know, like the, the typical stuff. Did you have a hard time finding those parts over there? Or again, now we're talking about 2018. So yeah, uh, or 2019, it's easy to get parts shipped. You've got DeLorean go over there. Actually, right after I picked up the car, I, I drove over to Ed's place in Holland. So I was like, okay, you have a website and I already bought stuff there, like, right when I got the car, because it was, like, so picky, like, that carpet in that little compartment behind the driver's seat. That looked kind of, like, messy, so, like... <laughs> you wanted new carpet. <laughs> yeah, what well, just that one carpet, you know, because that was the only one that he had, because, like, the one on the passenger side also, like, at some point there was something with the battery, but, like, lucky enough, I still found everything somewhere yeah and and it took about like i would say like two and a half years until it really got to the point where nothing did break down again and you felt comfortable driving it anywhere yeah did you do the main work uh mechanical work or did you no. take it to a local shop um first i tried a couple of more local people here but then i met this I was at a DeLorean show in Belgium and I met this incredible guy, like his name is Steve. And um, he is like the the secret DeLorean weapon in Belgium, France and parts of Holland because he doesn't even have a website. Oh, nice. I talked to so many owners there from Belgium and everybody said the same thing when I asked like, so who does your stuff? Steve, Steve, take it to Steve. Steve, Steve. <laughs> everything, including because like there was one thing also on my car, which I guess goes with the disco light in the bezel, that the front and the <laughs> rear fascia, they were painted, but like in this, <laughs> so, I mean, from if you were like a little bit further away, it looked kind of like all the other ones, but when you got closer, it had this sparkly sing in there like you know oh. it looked like it was made out, out of a dress that belonged to donna summer or something <laughs> like that sequins in the pl in the paint sparkles yeah. in the paint exactly so that guy was a, he was a disco fan obviously all those lights in the license plate bezel and then he's repainted the fascias with with uh glitter disco silver yeah absolutely <laughs> and i mean so and then i brought it to steve and he took care of everything and well, since then, well, I had another fuel pump that blew, but like, I, I guess, you know, that's just like... It happens, like, sure. Yeah, exactly. Now I have a spare one. <laughs> <laughs> just so you don't have to wait for the parts. Oh, that's awesome. So you have a mechanic that you trust, the car is taken care of. Now, you said it was a couple of years, so you bought the car and basically got it up to speed by 2019, 2020, and now you're taking it on longer trips what's the furthest you've driven it well the, the furthest is always um because like every two years i ship the car to belgium to steve but then when he's done with everything in the spring then i just fly over there and drive back that's nice. like 800 
eight about like eight hundred miles. Wow, that's a good trip. But often I do those regular like road trips, like where I live. It's only like an hour away from Austria, and there is this incredible country road. And just like last Saturday, I mean, this is how crazy it gets. Like, I drove from my place to Innsbruck, which is like, gets, I would say like 100 miles. And all I did there was like, get a coffee at McDonald's and then drove back. Nice. Oh, that's but, fantastic. Just to go for the drive. Exactly. Like, who cares where you go? You know, as long as you have a credit card and gas station somewhere, <laughs> it doesn't matter, you yeah. know. And plus, like, yeah, if something breaks, then you know, okay, that's something that needs to be taken care of. Yeah. It's part of owning a classic car that's 40 years old. Have you had any major breakdowns? Um, Yeah, when the fuel pump broke, and then I had a warm-up regulator that broke. Oh. That was pretty much in the early stages. You know, like now, since those warm-up regulators, you cannot buy those new anymore. Yeah. And there's some crappy aftermarket ones which i tell everyone don't buy those find someone that can um, restore the original one and that's what he did oh that's so lucky wow yeah so you've not had any major breakdowns when you're out on the road things that were just no blown engines or anything no nothing what story comes to mind when you're out there driving, whether it's local or long distance over in Germany, any any fun stories come to mind that you share with others? It's always, I remember like one time a friend of mine was working in a hotel. I said I pick him up after he's done with work. So I drive there and the hotel was like right in the middle of Munich. So I get there. And the second I park the car, I hear from somewhere upstairs, oh my God, there's a DeLorean. (laughs) And the security guy of the hotel was like, oh, don't worry, I'll watch the car. So I go inside, pick him up, and by the time we get out, there's like 50 or 60 people surrounding the car. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. And that was just crazy and, and funny. Um, there was an American car show like just a few weeks ago in, in a farmer town close to where I live. So I wanted to go there. And then the security guy of the place says like, oh, sorry, but Japanese cars are not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, so what do you think it is? And he's like, well, that's a Suzuki. I know that. I was like, <laughs> Suzuki? <"What?"> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> How did you convince him that it wasn't a, a, an Asian car? No, I, I was just laughing. You know, I said, because like, <laughs> <laughs> it was just hysterical. And plus it was hot anyway. And I was like, you know what? Like, I'd rather go somewhere else. Oh, so you, you like... didn't even go into the show with the car? No, because also when I got there, I noticed that like the place where the cars are is like this weird sand stone crap thing. So if you bring your car there, because I looked at some of the other cars and they already look like they've been sitting there for like a year. So I was like, no, I'm not going to do that because then it takes me like two days to clean the car again. I was like, no. Still, Alex, that is that is a funny story. And sure, it's a Suzuki. I've argued with people when I lived in Anaheim in Orange County, California. I went to pick up from uh, Craigslist ad garage door opener somebody was selling. He oh. insisted that they built them right down the street in Irvine. I'm like, well, that's where they stored them. They were not built here. No, no, they built them here. I'm like, okay, they rebuilt some of them. And it just is a crack up. It's like, I'm driving the car. I know the history. And uh, I always thought that was fun. But to, for somebody to say it's a Suzuki, no, no, no Asian cars allowed. That is funny. <laughs> you know, that that's just like, and it's always interesting, like when you drive anywhere, like how people freak out and you know want to take photos that's actually why i had this qr code made like a decal for the rear window and this brings you straight to alexmichael.com and the first thing on top there is the some of the delorean related stuff like the book and the song we did and everything so it's like hey it's free advertisement and i can tell when i look at the statistics of that page i can always scanning it yeah. yeah, exactly. Or at least where that person is coming from. And it's like, well, that's where I've been yesterday, you know. How funny. So that's a good thing, you know. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> okay, so 
you basically have had the car for just a few years now. You've not, you're not a super long owner. How many times yeah. have you come to uh, any kind of a, a bigger show? I mean, DCS is over here in the U.S. is kind of the only big show that we have now. Because I was at a couple of the German ones, but like the German ones are way less fun. Because like in my opinion, when you do like a the lawyer convention or anything like that, it should be more about the car and not um, going to see music halls and or sausage factories and st- <laughs> stuff like that. Because to me, that has nothing to do with the car. Yeah, I mean, right. I would understand if there's like a screening of Back to the Future, anything like that. But sure. The, yeah, the, sausage the, factory is not connected to the car in any way. Not really. Yeah, you were saying that fans are similar. In that what we're focusing on, the specific details of the car or, for KISS, specific songs or or musicians? Yeah. For example, like when Ace really left the band, uh, like, geez, that's been almost like 20 years ago. And now they have this replacement guy. So I always call it like Ace is the original PRV and the new one is like some replacement engine out of a Honda or something. (laughs) You know, and then of course people are fighting about that. Like, oh my God, I can't believe he's not in the band anymore. Oh my God, I can't believe it's not the original mo- engine anymore. <laughs> it's the same thing. Interesting. Okay, I was not making that connection, and now I can see what you're talking about. There's yeah. the the guys that like the carbureted PRV, and the yeah. guys that like the fuel injected. Going for a little second, uh, even though we did a DCS wrap up episode, I'm still so. I'm not a car guy, and I'm still so blown away by that LS4 engine. I yeah. think that is the future of the DeLorean as as new owners in the next 5, 10, 15 years buy these cars. And if they want to drive them, I can see them going to Mike at DeLorean Midwest and saying, hey, swap out the engine. Let's get a better, stronger engine in there. Well, Even I though guess... the PRV is trustworthy, but people are going to want uh, updated engines in there. I guess it depends on where you live. Because, like, for example, I mean, I'm also not a, a car guy or a mechanic. I mean, like, I, I can clean a car. Like, you should have seen what I did to the interior, like how I cleaned my carpet. It was like I bought different chemicals and fluids and whatever, I think, for like $500. Oh, man. To get every kind of smell, stain, whatever it was, you get this carpet clean. People always ask me, oh, so did you replace your carpet? No, only one piece. No, actually two pieces. But like here, I don't think it would it would be impossible to register the car with the Alice engine in it. Because like in Germany, we have this organization called TÜV. And if the car is not original, A, you lose your historical license plate. Uh-huh. And B, they would insist them on doing all those like tests, road you know, tests if, and safety tests and everything. Yeah, because like, uh, will the frame be able to handle all the extra power? What's about the brakes and oh, this and that? So, I, I remember like a friend of mine. This is like a long time ago. He did a conversion of a Pontiac Fiero you know, into one of those Ferrari kits, uh-huh. and just the fees for all the TÜV papers was about like 15,000. Wow. Because they would test everything. I mean, also like the rims. Oh, what's about the wheels? Will they hold this and, and that and whatever? Interesting. And then let's say like the whole conversion. I mean, I don't know how much it costs, but let's say like 40 grand. But then you probably have to expect like, I would say like another 15, 20, whatever. And, but that still doesn't mean that's going to pass. Give... Yeah. Exactly. That's just to get it tested. And then it, they might say, sorry, doesn't fit. Interesting. That's also the reason here you cannot buy those uh, or you cannot drive one of those um, back to the future conversions. Time machines. Because, sure. Yeah. Because of the open cables that are like on the side. Because like the TÜV <laughs> would say, oh, this is too dangerous. What happens if somebody gets stuck? <laughs> right. Is that just in Germany or is that Europe in general? I'm not sure about the other countries, but I, I know the story about a guy in Switzerland. There's actually a video about that guy on YouTube 
where he talks about that they first didn't want to register the car because of the doors. Oh, my gosh. Wow. I know. And then I guess he found a couple of other DeLoreans that were already in Switzerland. So he convinced them, look, that's how they are. Wow. So for me, that's just not... I do feel the same way for me. I don't need more power. I don't need... It, the car is great the way it is. I don't yeah. need to race anyone. I can just see that as the car becomes more collectible, more people with money buy them. If they want to drive them, they're, they're gonna, they might be looking to do something different. Well, and especially as the engines become more rare, if it's going to cost the same amount to find an original PRV versus putting another engine in, well, unless you're trying to keep it original or you live in Germany... <laughs> Exactly. Well, Try something else. The only changes that I did with my car, because, I mean, like, let's face it, like, goes also for yours. We are not in the super desirable circle. So, you know, like, not like the early wins or, like, the last few ones or right. something like that. So what I did was, like, I just combined everything from 81, 82, 83 to make it, in my opinion, like the most perfect car that, that I want. For you, exactly. Exactly. Like, like one of the big things for me was always like the original design for the real logo. Oh, yes. Let's talk about that. Explain that. Well, probably most people know like, like some of the, the early press photos. And there's also a video when the first car drove off out of the factory. When you look at that car, that one has the painted real logo on. In you're talking about in the left side of the bumper where it's embossed in the bumper that says DeLorean. Exactly. And the first ones, they had a painted real logo. You know the catalogs, that there's the big catalog, like the, the 16 or 20 page one, the big one. Mm -hmm. But then there's also smaller one. And on the smaller one, if you look at the picture on the rear, it also has the painted real logo on. Interesting. Yeah, the stainless letters, but then I was like, no, I, I like the other design like a million times more. Plus, that's how it was supposed to be. It's kind of like a bonus track on, on, a, <laughs> on a CD or something. So no DeLoreans actually were sold or shipped that way. This was just one of the early cars during testing. Yeah. But you like that. Yeah, Chris Nicholson has... Also, he has one that was actually painted in the factory. Right, uh, as a as one of the demos or tests, not a not exactly. a yeah, not a dealer car. No, not shipped. No. What you're talking about is rather than having the stainless letters that are cut out and fit perfectly into the embossed letters in the bumper, yeah, you have an outline of those letters out of I'm assuming stainless. I haven't seen your car. No, it's painted. Um, oh, it's just it, painted. It's it's actually airbrushed. Airbrushed. So basically, if you painted us a, a long rectangle over those letters and then yeah. cut out the letters, the yeah. letters are still black, but there's the outline of the words. Of exactly. The word. Nice. Then it's, I know there's a picture on your website. You can see it, that early car with the, the painted letter yeah. outside of the letters. Yeah. Got it. So that's what you have on your car now. Yeah. And also, I replaced the hood because, like, my car missed the grooved hood, like, just two days or something. And Ed from Holland, he had an extra grooved hood. So I bought that one from him, and we did put that one on the car. And now the original hood is as safe as it can be. It's hanging on the wall in my office. And funny <laughs> enough, I had Chris Nicholson also brush that one before we did hang it on the wall. So it looks like it's brand new. Oh, that's great. In the office, it's just always like when I sit in the office and do some work and I just look at this. And I always say, you look so nice, but not on the car. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a great art piece to be hanging on the wall. Oh, that's fantastic. Absolutely. And a friend of mine in Detroit, I have to get it at one point. He still has like a left fender, but like that fender looks like it went to hell, then oh. was swimming in a volcano and then whatever else. And wow. that's how it looks like. And I said, like, I got to bring it back to Germany and then um, turn it into like a, some crazy wall clock. <laughs> Use it as an art piece. Yeah, exactly. Because it's 
beyond like uh, I showed it to Mike and he was just like laughing. He said it's like <laughs> nope, not gonna no. mess with it. And also I, I showed it to Chris first and he also like everybody I showed it to they were just like laughing. I said, like, <laughs> this is beyond any chance of repair. I, I will turn it into something once I have the chance to bring it over. Sure, sure. All right. Let's transition over to talk about the book because it is an absolutely beautiful book. It is called Looking Inside the Stainless Sensation. The website is what? How do people find it? It's DeLoreanBook.org. Great. How did this start? Because uh, I know I had heard about the book. I didn't expect you to be at DCS. Uh, I bought a copy from you. You signed it. That's great. And I don't know the history or, or the backstory of it. I know nothing. Well, this was even before I bought my Deloitte. I was so fascinated by the the story. And a lot of things, in my opinion, didn't make any sense. You know, like that, that videotape, for example, because you can tell like it's been doctored and cut and, you know, Everything. You're talking about the FBI video yeah. with John in the hotel room with the, the suitcase exactly. of drugs, yeah. Yeah, exactly, that he didn't bring. Or, right, that they brought wanna... and didn't touch, yeah. Exactly, and also, like, there was this interview with um, Howard Weitzman, his lawyer, and this was, like, a long time ago, where they asked him about, you know, well, but you see him in that room, and he's laughing and saying, like, oh, it's better than gold. And Weitzman said, that's what I told him to do. I, he said, like, don't confront them because they assumed those guys were mafioso, drug dealers, whatever. So, it, Well, they threatened to kill his daughter if he exactly. didn't show up to the meeting. Exactly. Yeah. And he went to the lawyer before he went there with the names and records of phone conversations and everything. Yeah. And then, of course, you have to play along. I say that all the time, too. There is the letter included in one of – I can't remember which book it is now, but he has the letter from his lawyer that says, yeah. basically, I'm going to go and play along with this because they threatened to cut off his daughter's head and mail it to him if he didn't – because he tried canceling the meeting, and they said, no, you're showing up. I even heard the audio of that conversation where they threatened him. There was a – it's insane because, like – my DVD player broke with that DVD inside, so I have to get it again. There's a documentary about the guy from Hustler magazine. Yeah, uh, Larry Flint. Yeah. yeah, Larry Flint. He Yeah, he bought that all that stuff, yeah. Exactly. And so in that documentary, you hear part of that conversation. Wow. Yeah, and like all those things like got me so interested in the story and, and all of that. And then I got already my hands on a lot of like interesting documents and but I was talking with Barry Wills all the time and I asked him did you ever go to the National Archive in London and he was like no because like at that when he wrote his book everything was still under lock so I was like okay but that was a couple of years ago let me try so I called there and said like you know I need the, those files and this and that and, and the woman was like, yeah, no, no problem. Like, you just have to register and send us an email which files you want, and we prepare them for you. And then you can come, and and she said, like, yeah, but you cannot take them with you, but you can scan everything that you want to scan. Wow. And I was like, so I went there with, like, three of my friends, and within four hours, we scanned a total of 6,000 pages. Wow. We all had iPads or iPhones that have that scanner app on it. Yeah. And I told everyone, okay, don't drink anything before we start. Don't eat, whatever. <laughs> so we don't waste time going to bathrooms or whatever. Picked up the trolley with those stacks of documents and started, boom. And we finished actually, I think, like six minutes before they were Closing. ready to close the place. Wow. Now, at that point, I'm sure you got distracted looking at some of the stuff, but you're just trying to get stuff scanned so that you can look <laughs> yeah. at it later. Did you have the intention of writing a book? Yeah. Okay. Because I wasn't sure, like, how to approach the whole thing. and So you had some of these early documents, and you, and you thought, hey, I want to write a book. Yeah. That's, is that when you started talking to Barry Wills? Um, I talked to Barry before that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Which was always funny because, like, when I explained to him the thing with Ace Freely, he 
had he, he had no idea about Kiss. Right. Because right. like obviously at that point he was like a very busy successful person like in the car industry so right. like his priorities were not checking out <laughs> rock bands in the 70s right right <laughs> okay mean, so they... so you go and scan these documents and you're yeah. thinking okay this is a treasure trove you're going to be able to make this great book did you have a direction did you know what you wanted to write about or was this yeah because from also what i did like i went and got into a couple of like archives in the states where I got all the newspapers and stuff, like stuff that was never mentioned anywhere else, you know, just like some local Detroit magazines and whatever. So I found so much information, and then I was lucky to purchase the the Elsa archive, the uh, the picture archive. I don't know what that is. Okay, um, Deloitte had one photographer that took all the images in the factory and, you know, when they built the factory of the cars on test drive, when they built the gold ones and everything. And at some point that guy retired and then he sold it to someone else. And, but that guy also retired and then I bought the archive. Wow. Congratulations on that. I'm so glad it went to you, somebody who's nice and passionate i'm so glad you got that that's great oh, thank you yeah because it's also like i mean like in my office I, i'll send you some pictures later like one of the walls in my office is the, the side of the one of the parking lots in belfast you know with all the deloins it's like my whole wall is that image oh that is so cool wow i did not have any clue where you got the pictures for this book because it's so many that have never been yeah. shared anywhere before Plus, I found some people. I mean, like, it's sometimes everything is in front of you. You just have to look out for it. Like, the yeah. picture on the cover, there was a small Boston magazine, uh, a newspaper. It had the picture in the article of, like, at some point, 82. And I was like, oh, my God, that picture. That's the best picture I've ever seen of a Deloitte. Like, those young kids, like, you know, especially... None of them thought about, oh, what's about the company or this or that. You just see the excitement in their eyes. And I looked for the photographer, but like he died. So I found his daughter on Facebook and I contacted her and I said, like, do you still have those images? And she was like, oh, let me have a look. And I called her and explained the whole thing to her. And I was like, oh, my God, this is all so crazy. And then she, a couple of days later, she got back to me. It's like, yeah, I I found a binder that said DeLorean and I'll send you all those pictures and you can use them. Wow. And she was so excited when, because obviously I sent her a copy when the book was done because I actually, where you see the photos, there's also like a little section where I talk about the photographer. Her dad. Yeah, exactly. And she was like freaking out of like, oh my God, like nobody did this before. And like, like she was... And I was like, that made my day, like, just to, because I saw that picture, and I was like, this is so great, but then also to later find out that, like, you know, how much it meant to her and her brothers and everyone that, like, you know, her father was actually mentioned somewhere, and not just his name in the credits. Yeah. Well, that's very nice job on that. Very nice. And also, when I saw the picture what should the title be of that book? And then I saw the picture. I was like, looking inside, end of the story. Like, there's no better title because it fits the image of those kids looking inside the car. On the cover, and yeah. And the book looking inside the, the history of the company. Yeah. Because I always felt like everything has to go together. I mean, I, I guess that comes from my music background because also, I mean, the, 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 the case for the book, <laughs> you, you cannot imagine, like, what a pain in the ass it was to the the printer because I said like no it has to look like stainless. <laughs> it's hard to print stainless paper. Yes. Exactly. And then what well, my my original plan was like to actually make us a, a, a steel a case. case. Yeah. Yeah. But like when I saw the expenses for that, I was like, no. <laughs> yeah, twice the cost of the book just for a case. Yeah. And then also like when I got the first prototype and I looked at the spine of the book and I still have that prototype. And I was like, oh, my God, this is all wrong. If the case looks like a, 
a DeLorean, then like the spine has to look like the grill of the car because otherwise it doesn't make sense. <laughs> and then we changed it like like last second pretty much to the spine that it has now. <laughs> uh -huh. Wow. And I, I said if I do another one, then of course like the case would have to have the white stripes on. Oh, nice. Because <laughs> I'm I'm such a fan of the white stripes and. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. When did the book come out? It came out in... December 2020? Um, that's when we started the pre-order. I shipped all the books in March of 21. Because some people asked me before, like, oh, you should do an earlier pre-sale. But I'm always paranoid that something could go wrong. And I've seen it with bands. Oh, I've yeah. Seen it with other people that want to release something. They take all those pre-orders for a year or two, and then something happens, and the guy is bankrupt. Right, you know, and then you don't get your money back. Yeah, there's companies that have been doing that for a while, taking pre-orders on uh, on cars that will never get built. But exactly, whole, yeah. And I don't believe in any of this. Like, I mean, even when I did my band Shameless, when we did the first record, I didn't tell anyone about it because it was kind of like, I mean. If it happens, well, great. If it doesn't, you don't want to be on the hook. Yeah, because especially like back then, it was like, I mean, before I was like a local musician here in Munich. And then like to make like a public announcement that I will go to the States and record a record with people from Kiss, Guns N' Roses, Alice Cooper and Motley Crue. Everybody would have just thought like, this is nonsense. Like, you know, so I was like, no, <laughs> let's rather shock the people with the announcement once the record is done. And I still believe to this day, like, that's the only way to go. And I only started the pre-orders on the day when I got the notification that the books were shipped to me. Because I was like, okay, the only thing that could happen now is, like, that the ship sinks. But then, like, you know. <laughs> that's they out were... of your control. Exactly. So I was like, no. I love the story of the photographer's daughter. That's great. Yeah. Any, other, any other fun stories about writing the book or prepping it or selling it? Well, just the whole process of making the book. Originally, like I did the book during 2020. All the lockdowns, yeah. Exactly. So when the lockdown came, I was like, okay, this is perfect. Now I have the time. I don't have to leave my house. Nothing will distract me or whatever. And so I can just focus on the book. I mean, like I wrote most of the stuff already before with Barry. The biggest thing for me was also like to put it all in order because most guys when they do a book they just write it and they they give it to some graphic guy and that right. guy puts it together some editor puts it together and then you exactly. go back and say oh that looks fine yeah and i do also for my band for shameless or like also for sheree i do all the artworks i mean with the band stuff i write the songs i produce them and i also do the artworks for me it's always when i start something it takes a little moment and then like I see it in my head, how everything has to look. And for me, the biggest thing was I didn't want to put out a regular book because when you have a regular car book or whatever book, you know, you have a white page with writing and then on the next page, there's a picture and this is how the book goes. And I wanted to make it li like a tour program. If you remember like from any, you know, like in the 70s, 80s, like, or, or even now, like the KISS tour programs. For example, it's always this overflow of everything. Like every page is full. Full, yes. Yep. For me, the best example is always the chapter pages. <laughs> when you look at a regular book and there's, let's say, chapter six, it's a white page and it says chapter six. That's all. It takes one second or maybe like <laughs> if yeah. your eyes are not good, it takes you five seconds to look at that page. <laughs> and then you just flip it. Yeah, exactly. And for me, it was like pretty much like all the chapter pages. I used the headlines of that year in regards to DeLorean and filled up that full page from top to bottom. So and then I showed it to a friend of mine and to a neighbor of mine and said, OK, can you look at the watch or your clock? How long it takes you to go <laughs> through that page? And both of them said something between like 15 and 18 minutes. And I was like, that's what I need. Nice. It's full. I wanted, I mean, like originally, <laughs> I'm like 
Barry was just shaking his head. It was like, how much? What else are you gonna put into that book? And he was like, yeah, it shouldn't be more than like three hundred pages, and that was the original plan. But then I found this other stuff and this and that. I was like, no, I can't leave that out. Just at one point, it was like, okay, no, five hundred is enough. <laughs> <laughs> and Barry is fantastic, and his his book is fantastic, but that is a dense book. I mean, that is single space, basically, and just pages and pages and pages of text. There's so much information in there. Yeah. It is hard to get through just because there's so much, but it's not as visually appealing as what you've done. And on the cover of your book, which I really like that you put it, at the bottom it says, a scrapbook of... Yeah the most incredible story in automotive history. And that is what you're talking about, is it's not just a chapter page, it's not just a page of, a white page with text on it. Yeah, because I want to, like, words are good for certain things, but, like, it's not visual. Pictures tell stories. Yeah, and then there was just always, you find another person that has pictures from a dealership. And then somebody else that had pictures from when they installed the DeLorean logo at the dealership. And then, like, there was a party and then this and that. And I was like, okay, you have to include that. And, and also for me, the big part was always to make sure that the pictures are big. I'm not yes. going to mention the name of the book, but there was another DeLorean book that has images. And it's impossible to tell what's on those I, pictures. I know. I I 100% know what you're talking about. It's so frustrating because you want to look at the yeah. detail and study it, but the pictures are so small. And the page is big, but they purposely made the pictures so small that you can't study the photo. It's just exactly. an afterthought. And, and that's that was my biggest concern that like nothing should be like that in the book where you're like, huh, what is that? I mean, like the only page where I maybe made a little bit of a compromise was like, the page about the toys, but that was just like, just to see it. I didn't want to go in depth of like, oh, sure. now here's a list of all the hot toys, hot wheels, right. hot dogs. That's a whole what separate else? book for somebody that's a toy collector. Exactly. Yeah. And also brings you back to the Back to the Future because when some people said, well, Back to the Future should have a, a chapter in it. And I was like, no, it's I don't a... think uh, Marty or Michael J. Fox or any of those people worked in Belfast or at the DeLorean Motor Company. <laughs> so why should they be as an important chapter in the book? It doesn't make sense because the movie came after the company. Yeah. You know, that's like you don't put cheese on the floor. You put it on the pizza. <laughs> so for me, it was like not to this, because of disrespect, but like I already had a hard time fitting everything into those 500 pages. Yeah. And then to fill it up with a couple of like time machines or whatever. And it's not needed. There's other no. books. There's other videos about that. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful book. Thank you. Anybody listening, if you don't have it, World According to Dave Tavers here, spend the money and get one. Because at some point, they're going to be out of print. And yeah. Alex is going to be on to something else. Or the price is going to be twice as much to have them reprinted. Uh, I don't take you as the, even though you are a musician, I don't take you as the guy that's out there just trying to suck money out of people's pockets. It is a beautiful book, absolutely worth the money. You could have charged $200 for it. I'm glad that you didn't. Uh, I mean, no. really amazing. So thank you for, on behalf of the DeLorean community, for doing that book sincerely. Thank you. I mean, I have books that are like expensive, whatever, but I was like, no, the price of that book has to be $88. Right, right. I don't care. As long as I don't lose money, I don't care. And that's why I'm saying thank you. You could have done a, a very different thing. And I've met some other people. I mean, Barry and you know the European guys are all wonderful. There's some people yeah. in the States. All they care about is how much money can I get out of these people. So you're part of the community. You're truly part of the community. You care about the car. You care about the people, the community. Uh, thank you for making it for us. Oh, thank you. If you haven't bought one, uh, DeLoreanBook.org. Go order one. Don't put it off. Uh, I'm I'm not getting paid for this. Uh, I bought my book, but it really is something that you'll want on your bookshelves for sure. And it's going to take a while to get through it. <laughs> yeah, that that was also the, the big concern for me. Like, because I remember one journalist in Germany said like um, 
it's almost too much information. And I was like, no, if you go to, I, I compared to like a all you can eat restaurant, you go there and you go for a reason to all you can eat. You don't go to there to, uh, to say like, well, I want two slices of cucumber. That's all I want. Right. And, <laughs> and hey, what do you prefer? Like a book that you're done with in like an afternoon? Or, I mean, like I had enough people that told me it took them about like three or four months to get through the full book. Yeah. And also reading all the little stuff and the documents because that was the main thing for me because like showing the documents, I was a kid, you know, when the whole thing happened. So for me to just write a book, I think it's stupid because like I wasn't there. Right. That didn't make sense. But like at least I would be able to tell the stories to, yeah, like and also to show it in detail with pictures and everything. Let people figure out the story on their own by reading the documents. Exactly. I mean, like, there's so much funny stuff in there, you know, like with, like, the uh, some of those board meetings and the secret shoppers and stuff like that. It's just, like, I was laughing when I <laughs> went through all that stuff. Oh, my God. Like, how can you have people like that work for you that don't even know about the car? <laughs> And it was a lot of fun, and because the, then also we did the the song for the book, and to me that was like the biggest surprise, like how people went crazy about that song. It was actually um, the drum and Kiss, Eric Singer. I, I'm really close friends with him, and at one point he said, like, you should do a song with the book release. Oh, why not? You know that business. Yeah, and then I was like, okay, um, and I just said. I tried something out and obviously like live your dream came to my mind within like five seconds. And then I, I wrote the song and then we did a video with car scenes and everything. Now when I go to car shows and whatever, and people play that song in their cars or actually in Northern Ireland, it had some massive like radio airplay as well. That's cool. And also like on Spotify, you know, cause you know how it is like these days, there's like such a music overflow. Oh yeah. Of everything. Tons of content. But then when I look at the numbers of that song on all the digital platforms like uh, Spotify and Amazon and iTunes and everything, I'm still blown away like, you know, the massive reaction the song got. Wow. Well, Alex, congrats on all the, on the beautiful book, on the music, on everything. Thank you. So glad that you're part of the community, that you have come. I, I'm sure that you're going to keep coming anytime there's events like this. And Oh, yeah. No, definitely. Like, Because uh, the events in the States, they're also, like I said before, like it's way more fun. And I, I love those events. And everybody's so cool. I mean, like, Jesus, like Mike went out of his way to find me a set of floor mats and the original cleaning bottles. That's right. Yeah. Okay, before we wrap up, tell us that story because I thought that was fun. Yeah, because I asked a couple of people about the original cleaning bottles, you know, that, that cleaning set. And this is when you got your DeLorean at the dealership, it came in a, a cardboard box that had the three different polishes for the car. And yeah. you wanted an original set. Exactly, because, like, they still sell the original boxes, but, like, obviously – all the cleaning stuff has been replaced for new stuff because like trust me when i opened one of those bottles yeah i saw it like a cat died in there <laughs> 40 year yeah. old cleaning solution <laughs> yeah no that didn't smell <laughs> anything like clean or healthy <laughs> or whatever and so i always wanted to get the original bottles because they they have the print on the actual bottle yeah and then like mike looked and, and like he finally found one and he also found me a set of the original floor mats because that's something i don't know about you like which floor mats do you have in your car embarrassingly i have never got them uh there is a guy who came to dcs that uh, makes them he's a an upholsterer or something sadly running without floor mats they my car didn't have them when i got them okay i think it was a dealer option right that yeah, wasn't it, a default it was definitely an option, but like the thing is, all those new floor mats, I mean, they're not bad, not at all. But like, A, they are smaller, and the quality of the original floor mats is just outstanding. It's 
the floor mats are bigger and also much heavier. Like the material is way thicker than all those new ones. They last. Well, it's a yeah. different era. The only part where I say that there was a horrible part about the DeLorean was the stereo. <laughs> well, from a music guy, I can see that. Yeah, and it's like I did put a few of those documents into the book, but like I have, I think, like a few hundred letters and documents how crappy that Craig radio was. <laughs> Don't forget, like, Craig was like the house company i think for sears in the states oh wow yeah so it was not really <laughs> a sears uh, a sears car radio in a delorean <laughs> it, exactly that, that's why i replaced mine with like a, a time correct alpine stereo oh fun because also the lighting is exactly like the one in the delorean like the green one. Oh, nice so it fits that's great exactly and well when i I had no idea that like all those um, Lamborghini owners are killing for those stereos because like the Countach had the same stereo in it. Really? Yeah. Wow. And I found, because I did some research about that stereo, like what I wanted in my car. And then after some time I found out, okay, I need this or that Alpine. And then lucky enough, I found a woman on eBay Italy, which is completely different than eBay in the States or eBay Germany, whatever. She had a new old stock in the box. Holy cow. Because her grandfather did some tuning work for Lamborghini. Oh, wow. And when he retired, they forgot a pallet of <gasps> stereos somewhere. It was, I guess, in the basement of, of his workplace. Wow. And then they just left that pallet like in the basement of her place. <laughs> and oh, I those got are it. great stories when that happens. Oh, absolutely. And I got it for, for I think it was like 180 euros, which is about like $200. And it was absolute mint. The only thing, because I knew they, they break, um, was the, the rubber from the tape deck. Yeah, the belts. Yeah, the belts. And that was like a an extra, I think like 40 euros, like $50 that oh. I had to invest. But like now it's the perfect thing. And like, yeah. yeah, I always see people like, you know, when they say, oh, I need a rear view camera and this and that. I was like, <laughs> nope. nope. You have eyes and like the original one didn't have a <laughs> right. rear view camera or yeah. anything. Well, Alex, such a pleasure talking to you. I'm looking forward to seeing you at events in the future and hearing more stories and uh, just you're a lot of fun. And I'm so happy to have connected with you at the show no awesome i mean like i hope there will be one next year well we're talking about doing something over at ken Consulate shop next year but that's not planned out yet so if what, uh where's his shop in cincinnati not too far from zach delorean oh yeah so if if that comes together yeah uh, then we'll uh obviously you'll see it online and uh, i'll make sure to shoot you an email and say hey you got a plan to come over yeah, no, absolutely, because it's just always fun, and plus, like, you always find stuff that, you know, you never saw before, like the floor mats. I have never been bored. I've been to lots of DeLorean events. There's never, in my mind, a reason to not go, because you have different conversations, you connect with different people. It is about the community. There's all kinds of connections to be made, and I will always go to every event that I possibly can. Exactly. And that, that one last thing, because that's also one thing like that is so similar to the Kiss What With Kiss, let's say like you have the record unmasked and then there's a Japanese version and an American one and a German one, whatever. Hmm. And it's the same thing with the Lawrence. Wow, well, you have that version of the ashtray in your car. Right. <laughs> well, Alex, thanks again. Any last parting comments or thoughts? Well, I just cannot wait for like more events and then like there's just so much stuff going on. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the next things. Yeah, sure. definitely. This cool. will be fun. <laughs> All right. Last question. I ask everybody yeah. before we go right now in your DeLorean, what's in the trunk? In the trunk, hmm? there's the replacement floor mats a cassette case and underneath the carpet there's a snare bag where I keep all my tools and stuff because like I keep the spare wheel in my office 
Oh. As decoration, because <laughs> I, I'm never going to use it. Right. You're just going to get towed. Exactly. But like a snare bag, which you can buy at any music store, like a gig bag, it's a round case. And, and it, it fits, fits in that hole? And it fits everything inside that you might need, like extra bulbs, wow. <laughs> extra fuel pump, like a couple of tools and cleaning stuff. Whatever you need, it fits in that bag. Alex, that is a cool tip. A snare drum case or yeah, a snare but, drum bag yeah, fits a into the – a soft bag, and it fits yeah. in that – in the spare tire well of the DeLorean trunk. And I used the 14-inch one just because, like, I have a couple of extra belts and stuff also in that section there. So, like, <laughs> everything fits in there. And let's face it. You're never going to use that. Right. Yeah. I Spare tire. Yep. In fact, I've had it. There's been a couple of episodes where people have talked that they put that on and they drive two miles and it's dead. So there's no point. Exactly. Especially when the tire is like 40, <laughs> right. 40 years old. That's a... <laughs> All right, Alex. Thank you again, man. Looking forward to talking more in the future. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. As always, it is so fun to talk to owners and get their stories. And uh, there will be more coming. Uh, DCS definitely reinvigorated me, met a lot, lot more people. I know there's people that have been asking for years to do shows and, you know, one day we'll get everybody on. Uh, there's lots of stories to be told. If you haven't created a DeLorean census record for your car, don't forget, go to DeLoreanDirectory.com slash census and fill in the information. It is by far the best census record out there for the DeLoreans. There's lots of questions, but over the years, it's going to be a great help to know where the cars were and what has been done to the cars. It's a lot of fun. And even if you've already submitted a record, if you've made significant changes or you've moved, go create a new record. It keeps track of the history of every car over time. Of The same VIN could have five records if it's been moved or sold. So... Go take a look to see if your VIN is up there. And if it's not, do a record for it. Tell your friends about it. DeLoreanTalk.com, DeLoreanDirectory.com. And uh, looking forward to seeing you at the next show. <laughs>